Hello and welcome back to Compass Live, the only and therefore the best live stream dedicated to proof of work mining. Today on the stream, we got three top experts on miner extractable value, which of course has been a buzzword over the last year and has really kind of blossomed into its own industry of sorts with the rise of decentralized finance on Ethereum. But it's also a very important topic for Bitcoin as we see Bitcoin's transaction fees kind of being pretty tiny. We'll get into that a little bit later with Zach. I'm excited to talk about that. Before we jump into it, I want to welcome Zach to the show. Thanks for co-hosting. Yeah, this one should be a lot of fun. Uh, glad to be back. Glad everyone watching. Um, it's, it's funny you say MEV is a little bit of a buzzword because in the mining circles I'm in, you know, most people actually don't, you know, care or talk about MEV too much. There's sort of like bifurcations in mining circles of that nature. Um, I'm excited for this conversation mostly because I think there'll be some great like breadth and also depth in the conversation. Uh, the audience and myself, you know, don't aren't in the weeds of MEV, like sort of understand it conceptually at a high level. And then yourself, Will, and the other guests on the show uh, understand MEV through and through. So I'm excited sort of to look at it from a bunch of different angles and levels um, in, you know, the relatively short time we have, but it should be a great conversation. I'm excited. For sure. And if I understand MEV at all, these guys are writing the Bible of MEV. So excited to have them on. Uh, I'll let them do introductions. Uh, but I will say just to kind of tee off, we have a trader, a dApp developer, and then I would just call him like MEV Jesus, Robert here. So uh, Robert, we're actually, we'll start with you. Can you give us like a little rundown on what you do at Flashbots? And then we'll move over to Jordan and Nathan. Sure. Thank you so much. MEV Jesus is is a, a new one. So uh, <laughs> thanks for anointing me today. Uh, I'm Robert Miller. I'm a steward at Flashbots. I'm also a product owner of uh, Flashbots Protect. So our tools that help users and developers get front running protection on their transactions, uh, as well as Flashbots data. So all of our different um, data tools, uh, products that give historical analysis on MEV, as well as real time analytics on the Flashbots network. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Cool. Uh, I'm Jordan, Jordan Frankfurt. Um, I am a DeFi application developer. Uh, I work on, uh, I work for Uniswap Labs, building out the Uniswap protocol and the the DAP that most of our users are very familiar with. Um, been working there for almost a year. Um, and yeah, loving it, loving the, uh, the DeFi world. Um, the Salmonella paper or Salmonella blog post was what initially opened my mind to uh, MEV. Uh, so I Same. think that probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Sean. I'm honored to hear that you liked it. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Nathan. I've done a number of things in MEV, but I would probably describe myself as an MEV engineer, um, mostly trading MEV, but I've also been building a couple of products related to MEV. I was involved in the um, Flashbots Protect uh, API was recently launched, as well as a DEX that utilizes Flashbots for front-running protection. Um, I'm also known in some circles as the Salmonella guy. <laughs> if you read the blog post, that was a bit of fun. Um, but hopefully that doesn't define my legacy in MEV for years to come. That's very funny. Uh, I I um, will betray my ignorance again also on the show because I haven't actually read this uh, Salmonella paper. But maybe and dig into a little bit of the juicy details a bit later. Uh, before we get into some broader conversation, if you're watching, again, hit the like and subscribe buttons for two reasons. Not only does it help other miners find this content, uh, but more importantly, it makes us feel good about ourselves while you're watching. Um, to start off the MEV conversation, I kind of want, I, I want to start off at a, at a pretty high level. Um, when we were talking about MEV and some of the, the Compass, Slack and Telegram and Discord channels, you know, a bunch of our miners are basically just focused on 
hardware, their hash rate and uptime, and sort of uh, managing their payouts. Um, and a large percentage of them aren't familiar, you know, with MEV conceptually on, on really any level. Um, so without, you know, going into too many boring details, can can each of you sort of, you know, piece together like a high level overview of what minor extractable value is? Um, and I guess maybe a little bit more importantly, how it became like such a hot topic recently, because, you know, it's not like a brand new concept or activity, um, but it's become obviously much more discussed um, and, and focused on in the past year or two or so uh, than, than prior years. I'm curious to know a little bit about that build up and how that came to be. Um, so, Nathan, might hand it to you first and then Jordan and Robert will sort of go around. Yeah, I guess high high level overview of MEV. When blockchains were first designed, we designed them as systems of incentives. The idea being that incentives in the system would drive socially optimal behavior. And the financial incentive in this system originally was designed to be this reward that miners got from producing blocks. So this Bitcoin or whatever it was that the miners got for each block was what was financially incentivizing them to behave in a socially appropriate manner for the chain. One thing we didn't really think of when we were first inventing blockchains was this idea that there could be other value on the table that would be available to miners and that's what we call MEV maximal extractable value or minor extractable value to some people it's this value that can ultimately be captured by miners that is being left on the table and is there in addition to the block reward there's a lot of ways that we try and deal there's a lot of consequences both positive and negative potentially that can arise from MEV a number of solutions that people are uh, theorizing and developing to try and deal with this phenomenon yeah and I'd say uh, one of uh, yeah in Uniswap's um, situation, one of the uh, primary drivers of uh, MEV, or the primary MEV opportunities that we see is uh, sandwich attacks. So these are like when you look at a, a particular Uniswap transaction, often uh, the user provides a, uh, a parameter to their swap that allows for slippage. Um, so if the market shifts uh, and and the time between they brought when they broadcast their transaction and the transaction actually gets mined. Um, their transaction could still be valid because like the current market price uh, at some future block uh, is within their slippage parameter. Um, and that actually provides an opportunity for a miner or uh, a searcher in the Flashbots case to say, to come in and manipulate the market in such a way that it um, is still within, like the market has not slipped so much that it's uh, that transaction is no longer valid, uh, but the price is worse than when the transaction was initially broadcast. So the uh, the user, our user who uh, broadcast that transaction is getting a worse deal than maybe they anticipated, but still a deal that they were technically okay with. And the uh, the miner or the searcher can essentially take the margin between this, uh, the lower bound uh, on that slippage parameter and the initial market price as uh, their revenue. So, and, and just to jump in here and double click on something that, that Nathan mentioned, um, at Flashbots, we like to use the term maximal extractable value. It, it's fine to use minor too, but uh, the reason for that is that in any um, Turing complete smart contract blockchain, you're going to have someone, uh, some ability to extract value from transaction ordering. So in ETH1, this is the miner who orders transactions. In ETH2 or other proof of stake systems, this is the validator. So we'll have validator extractable value uh, in, in ETH2, other proof of stake systems. Um, and so like we're trying to move towards this, this maximal extractable value term. And, and that's why you might hear um, some people use that, some people use minor, but they really get at the same thing when it's just a little bit more expanded. Um, and to bring it back to the earlier question about why we're seeing more discussion about MEV now, uh, I think you can trace this story back to last year when the activity happening on Ethereum um, just blew up exponentially. More and more contracts, more and more activity, more and more money was being made. Uh, and we saw increasing amounts of um, opportunities for value to be made by placing transactions in certain places, right? So when um, you had a couple different DEXs on the chain, there are just more opportunities for arbitrage. Uh, and you saw increasing levels of sophistication of traders uh, like Nathan, as well as others that were um, forming relationships with miners to capture this in proprietary closed ways. And so one of the reasons why Flashbots launched is we saw all this activity happening. We saw the, the J curve of value that could be extracted. Uh, and we saw that closed and proprietary systems to extract it were being formed. Um, and there was increasing level, levels of sophistication. And we wanted to turn this into something that was closed and proprietary into an open and transparent system that 
aligned with the, the broader ethos of, of crypto uh, instead of just something in smoke-filled rooms and, and closed systems, right? So Flashbots released open software that anyone can use, anyone can submit their transactions to our network today um, and specify in a very granular way your transaction ordering preferences. So if you see uh, Will making a giant trade on a DEX here to sell some asset and it makes a huge impact that creates an arbitrage opportunity, using Flashbots you can specify, I want my transaction directly behind Will's. Um, and the miner runs an auction to auction off the top of their block space uh, and if you're paying the miner the most, um, your transaction will be mined directly behind whales, which is what you specified. Uh, and this this level of like granularity unlocks a lot of MEV opportunities that um, previously weren't available before, and I think is is part of that um, reason why MEV is so large. So just to sum that back up, uh, more interactions on chain, more contracts, more value. Um, initially saw closed and proprietary MEV activity happening. Flashbots released open and permissionless software that anyone can use. And I think all of those things are, are the reasons why we see more emphasis in MEV activity today. Yeah, I love that high level recap there, Robert. Because when we're looking at our audience, most of our audience is just miners. They have a machine, whether at home or at a co-location facility and they're mining, but they don't necessarily know where they, some of these rewards are coming from. Uh, most of our miners are Bitcoin miners, but we do have a subsection of Ethereum miners. And it's interesting just to look at this larger landscape and kind of zoom out from five years and say, what is this going to look like? And I, I think this MEV discussion matters for both chains, which is kind of where I want to take this next next question is, why does MEV as a concept matter at all? And uh, of course, there's this Flashbots or Flashboys 2.0 paper that came out in 2018, I think. Uh, was the year is published and it really was like the seminal work on why flashbots is a thing it's why everyone's talking about mev and that was like a jumping point for this whole discussion on mev uh, for on-chain applications so robert i'm actually going to throw it back to you and just to kind of tee off the conversation why does mev matter and why should miners care about it oh, there's there's so much to this question um and I think I will bring it back to what Nathan was saying about blockchains being designed to give people incentives to do things in a socially optimal way. Uh, and I think that many chains were not and still are not designed with these uh, extra economic incentives, maybe is one way to frame it, um, that come from transaction ordering in mind. And it changes the game theory of those chains in pretty significant ways. So for example, um, in, uh, I think it was February of this year, there was a fat finger trade that was placed uh, on 0x where someone bought um, five Bitcoin for $4 million. And this created a huge arbitrage opportunity for the first person that can then fill that order on 0x and immediately take their money um, away, sell it. You, you, you could make a couple million dollars doing that, right? Worth of ETH. Uh, and Ultimately, the party that is able to capture that is the miner, since they are the one that is able to sequence transactions, right? And if you are the first person that can capture that arbitrage, you, you place your trade filling the, the fat finger trade. That gives you more money in a single transaction than you get from um, mining hundreds of blocks in a row. And this drastically changes the game, uh, game theory and the incentives in mining the chain to the point where it might make sense for you not to build on the longest chain uh, but instead to roll back a few blocks and try to, to build on um, a previous block within the chain to capture that opportunity yourself. Uh, that's called a time bandit attack. And, and it's one of the sort of fundamental um, attack vectors that Flashbots was, uh, was created to try to mitigate and prevent. Now, there, there's all sorts of like long-term incentives in mining. There's reasons why miners wouldn't um, perform time bandit and bandit attacks. So I don't expect them to happen. But I think this is one example of kind of... Uh, how minor extractable value um, can introduce incentives into chains that people weren't thinking about before and why we need to study it in order to make sure that they're game theoretically secure. So I'll, I'll give one more answer quickly uh, and then I'll turn it out over to everyone else. I think the other reason why this is important is because the job of a miner has significantly changed in the last year. So before miners, um, so, so miners have always had two jobs really. It's, it's first to find the most profitable block and second, to propagate that block to the network and attest to it with some proof of work. Uh, and a year ago, finding the most profitable block was just sorting by um, the highest gas prices within your block. It's a relatively straightforward 
algorithm. There are optimizations you could do in the mempool, but 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 not that much, right? But today, finding the most profitable block means going and finding arbitrage opportunities. It's finding sandwiches. It's finding liquidations. It's finding um, token snipes. All of these more complex ways of ordering transactions that have exponentially more complexity than ordering by gas price. And if you're not able to offer the most profitable lock possible, you can't offer as good of returns as your competitor. And your competitor, your, your, the, the miners that are delegating their hash to a pool, in this case, uh, will move to someone that can offer better returns than you. Uh, and MEV is becoming increasingly uh, more and more a part of the overall returns of miners. And so if you don't, uh, if, if miners in general don't have this ability to create the most profitable block, uh, you could see economic centralization where large mining pools uh, and miners are more able to optimize their transaction ordering, offer better returns, use those returns to optimize even more, uh, extract even more MEV, and you can see how this would uh, become centralizing very, very fast. So I think those are two reasons that, that I'd highlight, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll let others jump in there. Hey, Robert, do you know uh, how much, uh, like what proportion of minor revenue comes from uh, MEV today? Uh, it depends on the day, somewhere between, I think, 5 and 10% of overall revenue. Um, I have that statistic, so I'll look it up in the background while we talk here. Yeah, the block has a little dashboard if, uh, if viewers want to go look that up. If you go to the block and then click Ethereum and scroll down, you can see the breakdown of minor revenue by a different type. Nathan, I want to bring a point that Robert made over to you to talk about, which is the short-term consensus instabilities you get from potential time bandit attacks and rollbacks. And Jordan, I'll also be really interested to hear from a, a DAP builder's perspective on this. But Nathan, I remember back in like April or May, was it? There was some r really spicy conversations in the Flashbots Discord talking about what would it look like if Flashbots was used to kind of break Ethereum and, and move some of the uh, miners who are not acting in Ethereum's interest away from everyone else. Uh, at least that's how I remember the conversation going. So be interested to get your take on why MEV matters for chain consensus. Yeah. The thing about MEV changing the consensus, the incentives of the chain is, as Robert said, it can start to incentivize miners to do other things other than just so doing the socially optimal process of, of mining blocks. I mean, when you have um, some MEV that miners are competing for in a block and it gets to be really huge, it can make sense economically for other miners to compete for that and start to try to roll back blocks. And users of a chain have this assumption that a chain is always going to be walking forward. That's kind of the assumed UX of the chain. And if the chain stops walking forward all the time and sometimes it's taking steps backwards or to the side or whatever or stopping for a bit, then it can break the user experience of the chain, and you can you'll see that users will start to to leave the chain. Um, this can be a really big problem. I mean, no one up until now has designed or put in place such a system for reorgs, but the economic incentives are quite large. I mean, an example to look at is the Binance hack that happened some time ago on Bitcoin. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head how long it was, but I think days, perhaps weeks even, where it would have made economic sense for miners to try and reorg the chain backwards to capture the profits from that hack. So sometimes the the economic incentives here can be huge, and it's almost uh, it's almost a situation of luck that we have such a we have such great blockchains in general right now in, in terms of MEV, and no one's actually attacked them directly in this manner. So I think it's really important for this reason that we're thinking about MEV, building solutions for MEV, trying to mitigate the negative externalities of MEV while promoting the positive externalities. MEV isn't always bad. Um, it's necessary in some situations for a healthy market. You need the arbitrage activity if you want to have liquid prices between DEXs. You need the liquidation activity if you want to have lending protocols survive. There's a whole bunch of positive factors to MEV. So it's not about killing or suppressing MEV. It's about mitigating the bad parts and promoting the good parts. Yeah, I'd say one of the bad parts was the uh, crazy gas races we often saw where uh, people were trying to outbid each other for particular MEV opportunities. And that negative externality of that was that, for example, Uniswap traders uh, who maybe had no idea this was happening would suddenly see skyrocketing gas prices where all the particular uh, opportunity was being pursued by different uh, people's bots. Um, 
I'd say that the, like, for example, uh, reorg uh, based opportunities um, don't affect uh, Uniswap quite as much um, from like a um, like a day to day, like normal use case experience. Cause like from like when I'm writing the interface, for example, like I, we just read from the current head state of the chain um, uh, at least well, even that can be a little complicated, but um, the, <laughs> um, it certainly matters from like an existential perspective. Like we obviously want the most stable chain that we can have. We want uh, our users to have like a, uh, an environment that adheres to like the assumptions that they have going in. Um, but uh, we have not uh, pursued any like uh, features, for example, today to deal with time banded attacks in Uniswap. Yeah, and, and if you saw short-term reorgs happen uh, very frequently, you might see like wallets or dApps show something like you should wait five blocks, you know, five times 15. Exactly. Seconds, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, and, and just to correct the record a little bit, Flashbot software can't be used for reorgs. I, I think I caught that from you, Will. So. <laughs> totally, to totally. Just getting a, a little over my skis here. But yeah, yeah that, that was, was a pretty interesting conversation back in April and May when uh, it was in the Flashbots Discord. So yeah, thanks for correction there. But Nathan, that was a pretty interesting conversation back then. Yeah, I mean, it got a little bit out of control. It was sort of a theoretical conversation in a private Discord. Then it leaked onto Twitter, blew up, and then all of a sudden people were actually building building this or saying that they were going to build this. And it was like almost a crisis point for Ethereum. It seems to have resolved itself naturally without anyone having to really do anything, which was nice. But I mean, it's an ever-present danger that's there. I kind of want to package up this conversation where we are at it right now and add a little bit of a flare like a bitcoin flare to it uh just for contextualization purposes and like on some level the answer is very simple in terms of me comparative mev opportunities and strategies and development on ethereum and other chains versus bitcoin on another level you know maybe the answer is a little bit more intricate but my question is basically in context of everything we've described and explained and understood so far in this conversation about mev like why why basically are there no opportunity or the, this many opportunities and this much development attention to uh minor and maximal extractable value on the bitcoin chain as opposed to ethereum and other chains um and maybe to add a little bit more interesting content to that answer like if or when would anything like that change uh for bitcoin like maybe as a preface or to set up some of your answers i know we're seeing an increasing amount of developer attention paid to covenant contracts built for Bitcoin and Lightning. Um, and if those reach, you know, a pretty high level of sophistication, there could be some interesting opportunities for MEV on Bitcoin. But right now, you know, there, there just really isn't that much. Uh, so I'm curious to know your guys' insights on why uh, that is and, and what, if anything, would sort of be a catalyst to kind of change that uh, that situation for, for Bitcoin miners. Um, Nathan, maybe you go first and then everybody else can jump in. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it's just simply a function of the size of DeFi currently on Bitcoin and that if we see that start to change, then we'll see the MEV situation start to change on, on Bitcoin. Really like the incentives and the opportunity from MEV are mostly, not all, not entirely, but mostly being generated by DeFi and the DeFi economy is just biggest on Ethereum at the moment. We are seeing people starting to make inroads into Bitcoin uh, with DeFi development. And as that becomes bigger, I think these problems will become more pertinent. Bitcoin, I've been mean, philosophically, it, it takes a very conservative approach to um, a lot of these issues. So they've sort of um, you know, they, they've pushed off a little bit of the DeFi development down the road a little bit, and I guess uh, using Ethereum more as a testing ground to see how these these issues are worked out. Yeah, for sure. Robert, Robert go ahead. Anybody? Yeah. Um, so I think Nathan hit the the uh, spoke to it very well. I think I would also note that there's more MEV on Bitcoin than I think Bitcoiners like to uh, acknowledge. In particular, there's a lot of uh, griefing vectors that you can make money if you assume that you are a counterparty in a channel and a miner uh, in the Lightning Network. So you can just, uh, you know, grief your counterparty, take a lot of their money, and I think most of that payment ends up going to the miner. There's like a bunch of different vectors where that is possible. There was a good article on this um, by a Lightning developer, Lisa, um, Nifty yeah. on Twitter. Uh, and then I think that there there are there, there's some MEV in Bitcoin um, that just isn't really being exercised by miners right now, and there's like some sort of uh, theoretical MEV that you could imagine too. So I, I kind of think of if there was giant arbitrage opportunities between centralized exchanges, 
uh, and you really wanted to be the first person to make a deposit at one centralized exchange, everybody has sold, you need to get new Bitcoin onboarded there. You could imagine a miner exercising their control over, yeah, this is the one. Um, you could imagine a miner exercising their control over transaction ordering to be the only party that deposits at that centralized exchange and thus is able to capture the arbitrage, something like that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I actually forgot about this article at um, Austin BitDevs uh, a bit ago. They mentioned this. It's for anyone watching who's you know interested in Lightning and also MEV, which I guess the Venn diagram there might be pretty small, um, but it's a, it's a great read. She explains some pretty interesting concepts. Um, yeah, Jordan, curious to know your insight too. You know, we, you and I personally offline talk a lot about, about uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum comparative ecosystems, um, you know, MEV on Bitcoin pretty small what if anything would change that yeah i think um actually robert the um the clockwork uh paper that you wrote had a particular like a, there's a section of it that gave me i think a decent uh like or a better generalized framework for thinking about mev opportunities um uh, and it's just that like every mev opportunity is like highly context dependent and when you have a uh a chain like Ethereum, where there is more context, like there's more state that can be manipulated, you therefore uh, will have more MEV opportunities. So, in the state or in the the case of Bitcoin, where you're primarily just managing uh, like transfers, and it's just UTXOs everywhere, right? There's a much uh, simpler uh, state surface on the chain than there is on Ethereum, and Ethereum is like orders of magnitude more complex, and therefore. Um, creative people can find more interesting things to do, uh, to manipulate. Um, so, I mean, as that state surface might change for Bitcoin. Um, with Ethereum, there's obviously certain uh, changes that are happening with like channel disputes. Um, and we'll see if there are more in the future. Um, I'm sure that people are going to keep building on Bitcoin and uh, so maybe someday we'll see some uh, some cool new MV opportunities arise. Maybe we should build it, Jordan. <laughs> I mean, there's already plans, right, for a AMM on Bitcoin. I think Jack Dorsey said he's going to build it. So, I mean, as soon as that AMM exists, there's instantly MEV available on Bitcoin. You you can't have the AMM without having MEV. I mean, it goes back all the way to that uh, Fire network or something like that back in like 2015 that Matt Corella tried to build with that relay network. Like, those are also I always see them as like infrastructure for maintaining MEV. Um, so it certainly exists. And James Presswich and Hasu and one other author have a paper back in 2019 talking about Bitcoin MEV and how that would lead to chain instability, which uh, Robert, I know you and I have had a, a few Twitter DMs about that subject. Like what would it look like for uh, transaction fees to become such a bounty for miners to start looking at reorging that network, which would be pretty interesting. Um, but I, I do kind of want to leave that subject where it's at and move on to talk about sandwich attacks and all that good stuff. So Robert has had some awesome uh, threads on Twitter, and I think we have one of them that Damien can throw up uh, here in a second. But I just want to go through some of the common MEV strategies we see uh, on chain. And I, I love these breakdowns and so does Twitter. Uh, you see it got, got a decent amount of likes there. But Robert, maybe we'll just throw it to you and then uh, Definitely want to get Nathan's take on this as, as he's often the one behind doing this. Uh, and then uh, from a adapt perspective, Jordan, your take on this. But what does a sandwich trade look like for viewers who probably for the first time are looking at something like this? So if, it, Damien, if you could sit right here, I think this is a good um, good screen to show what a sandwich trade looks like, right? So on you, you have a couple transactions here. I took this screenshot uh, like 200 days ago, so, so it's old. But a couple transactions here. Um, the bottom three are the sandwich that's been formed. And you have in green some random Dex trader, unsuspecting retail that's trying to trade on the Uniswap router. Uh, and their trade, like Jordan was describing earlier, has a parameter that basically says, I'm willing to accept up until this price. And after that price, my transaction will revert. I won't accept this trade anymore. It's not valid. So bots will listen to the mempool to watch for trades like the one in green that happened. Uh, and they'll look at the par this parameter I was just describing, the slippage of how much you can push the price up and try to understand, can I get in front of this person, buy up a bunch of whatever they're going to buy to raise the price? Then 
the victim buys a little bit more, raises the price even more. And the bot wants to know, can I sell what I've just front run them, bought in front of them with at a profit? And, and that's essentially how the sandwich attack works, right? I'll repeat it again. So the bot gets in front of our victim. They buy up whatever asset the victim is going to buy to raise the price uh, just to the limit of where their trade would no longer be valid. The victim then purchases uh, and they only get uh, the, the, the limited amount that would make their trade valid. And that raises the price a little bit more. And the bot can then sell at the increased price uh, after the victim at a profit, uh, essentially extracting some value from the original victim's trade there. Uh, and as part of that, you're also making a payment to a miner. So I, I think that's a sandwich attacks 101. Love it. Yeah, these things, when you see them on, you see them uh, or describe for the first time, it's a little mind boggling. But when you kind of start learning about how the DeFi ecosystem works and how things like Uniswap work, uh, and how they set prices, it starts to make a little bit more sense. Um, Nathan, when you're looking at this from a trading perspective, like what are you looking for and how did this kind of catch your eye in the first place? I know you've been doing this for quite a while, uh, but interested well, in your take. I've, I've sort of taken up the mantle of being the anti-sandwich bot trader uh, in the market. I guess I, I see it, I'm glad that, that Robert used the word victim because I do see it as an exploitative strategy and a negative externality of MEV. I mean, you can make the argument that the user set this slippage. So, you know, they're, they're consenting, they're saying, well, if I lose 1%, then I lose 1%. Oh, that's the minimum that I'll accept. But the reality is that's not the user's expectation of what's happening when they set their slippage. The expectation of the user is that normally my trade will get filled at the price that I set, the spot price, but there's going to be some natural market movements that are going to occur from time to time. And if these natural market movements occur, I'm willing to take a loss of 1% on the price that I've specified. The user's expectation is not that this is now a tax that I pay on top of the gas fee to get my trade confirmed um, into the block. And unfortunately, sandwich bot trading has made that the reality where the slippage that a user sets providing their trade is large enough has essentially just become a tax that they pay to be included in a block. So... Yeah, for, for that reason, I would definitely view it as a negative externality of MEV. But at the end of the day, I mean, really, the reason that sandwich trading exists is because of protocol design. It's something that is in the protocol design and value that's being left on the table, in particular because of the way that Uniswap V2 pools are designed. And this is something that I believe has actually been addressed to a large degree with Uniswap V3, with concentrated liquidity, in that now in Uniswap V3, often it makes sense rather than to exploit the user's slippage to do instead what we call a salad sandwich, where you come in before the user and you come in after the user. But rather than pushing the price of the pool and exploiting their slippage, you actually add liquidity to the pool. So the user gets a better price. And because you can concentrate the liquidity that you add around their price range, you're actually capturing more of the fees that the user is paying than other liquidity providers. So rather than attacking the user with your sandwich, you're providing the user a better price price and taking some profits away from the other liquidity providers. You could make the argument that long run, this is bad because it encourages liquidity to leave pools, but at least in the short term, it's not leaving users feeling like they've been exploited. Yeah. When we were designing, uh, well, I, mean, I say we, I was there for the designing of V3. I, was, I would not say that I was one of the drivers of it, but we had this conversation um, about uh, active LPs um, and how we felt about that. Um, because this is like this MEV opportunity is very real. Um, and we're like, okay, well, um, our users on V2, uh, our traders, um, are often being sandwiched. There's, um, there's opportunities for people to get worse prices than they expect by exactly the mechanics that you described. Um, and in V3, we, yes, have solved that to a great extent for uh, traders. Um, but um, the liquidity providers are, you know, they're our users in just the same way that our traders are our users. Um, and if they provide liquidity uh, in a particular range around a market price, they expect, um, they, they have like a, an expected value, right, for that particular range. Uh, so when someone's looking at the mempool and sees large trades coming into a particular pool and can uh, snipe that trade and withdraw their liquidity, uh, it diminishes their expected returns over time in a, a way that's like not immediately intuitive at all. Cause so you look at the liquidity uh, value for a particular pool and you provide your assets in that pool um, and you don't see these, right? Cause they're not static, uh, static deposits in those pools. 
So um, in the same way that I would say that uh, like people who sandwich are being malicious uh, by giving traders worse execution, I would say that the same logic probably applies to people who are like doing this like sniping based on like mempool information leakage of uh, trades on the LP side. Um, now, I, it's a little not maybe not quite as bad because like one person is get like losing like an actual dollar value of their uh, portfolio in a, in a trade, right? And the other person is like losing uh, revenue that they might have made otherwise. So. You could argue maybe that's a little bit more okay, but from a DAP developer's perspective, um, like our goal is always to uh, create a product that behaves the way users expect it's going to behave and that they're okay with, right? Um, and so while like, for example, the slippage parameter is like necessary for the functioning of the protocol um, and technically the user is like agreeing to it when they say, all right, I've got a 50 basis point slippage on this one or 2% slippage parameter on this other trade. Um, we don't want them to get the worst possible price. And in the same way, we don't want liquidity providers to like understand that this is theoretically possible and uh, maybe like get worse revenue over time than they, uh, might, they might expect when they're looking at the, uh, the data. Um, even though they might be okay with that, we, we want to give them the best possible experience. And so our, our goal as designers is to um, come up with a protocol that maximizes um, value for all participants um, to the extent that we can. Um, and it's a, kind of a constant battle, you know? So I, I've, got, really gone, two questions. Uh, I've, I've got two questions for you, Jordan. So, so the first is Nathan said that we call this salad sandwiches. And internally, Flashbots, we call it just-in-time liquidity. So, so what do you call it at, at Uniswap? Uh, I think we just refer to this uh, generally as active liquidity provision, which is kind of, um, now that I think about it, probably a bad name because it, that can describe two things. That can describe uh, like um, like vault-based uh, liquidity provision that happens like over longer periods of time, but is like actively managed. Um, and it can also describe this sort of like uh, liquidity sniping. Um, but we use it to describe both. Um, maybe we should adopt one of your terms. I like the I like those. I like the distinction at least. <laughs> I mean, it's really hard to think of a pool model that could possibly solve all these incentive problems on the level of a financial primitive. Maybe you could have all liquidity just be like super active and have users submit almost limit orders in some kind of limit order book and the liquidity can just fill it as users place the order. It almost, I mean, maybe there's a way that I haven't thought of. I'm not an AMM designer, but it's very difficult to imagine any kind of equation or, or like formula you, you could apply to an AMM that would fix this incentive issue. Yeah, um, we do imagine that uh, over time, uh, liquidity provision will become more and more active. Um, and, you know, it's theoretically possible that like we could end up uh, theoretically, I, I would be astonished if this ever happened, but technically it's theoretically possible that you could imagine a state where Uniswap is like highly functional and like has barely any liquidity, liquidity static on chain, right? Um, if all liquidity were doing this um, and people would get great prices and you would, it would look like there's very little uh, total value. <laughs> Yeah, you would almost have these pretty uh, pools bidding for trades. Do you do you think you have all the tools in place that you need to for that future to happen, or is there there are like pieces of the ecosystem that are missing? There, uh, we have not uh, directly been working on uh, like active vault management, um, it, you, either like the the static like on chain vaults um, or. Um, software to that people can run for themselves to manage their own money that does this sort of like mempool based sniping. Um, we've been hoping that the community would uh, develop those. And there are some projects who are working on these, like both of these projects or both of these uh, types of strategies. Um, I definitely want them to uh, develop further, you know, um, I'm, I'm excited about the ones that exist. Um, I'm hopeful that there, we will see more, um, in the future, yeah. I think the, the other thing that's interesting that pulls us in the other direction, I think to more liquidity on chain is direct to minor transactions. So we launched uh, Flashbots Protect yesterday and uh, we've had about 300 successful bundles, um, 300 successful transactions of doing like a bunch of stuff that were sent through our RPC endpoint directly to miners. So they never touched the mempool. Many of which I imagine are on Uniswap V3 um, or something similar to that, right? 
And so there's no opportunity for someone to come in, deploy liquidity before or after. They're just hitting whatever is on chain. Um, and so users won't be getting good prices if there are no liquidity there. But also those returns go to, uh, or the returns from fees go to LPs that are just sitting in the pool. So if you think private mempools and direct to minor transactions have become bigger, I think you're like bullish on uh, passive liquidity or you know not just in time liquidity. Interesting. I hadn't thought about that dynamic. I, that's definitely true. Uh, so just going to follow up on some of the discussion here. Like we're getting into some of the the buzzwords, which I'm a huge fan of, but I want to move over to the comment section. Like, and Daniel Anderson is asking about sandwiches of sandwiches, which of course we've definitely seen happen on chain. So uh, I want to give maybe Jordan a, a second to answer that, but I want to also expand from that, uh, from this question, just to look at the MEV landscape in general. Uh, Robert, I've seen some of your tweets and some other people, Flashbots, talk about how MEV is like this very deep bucket, right? Like we're only beginning to understand what is happening in the block space battles. You know, Uncle Bandit attacks, we didn't think that was really possible. And then that happened this year and that was just wild to see. So Jordan, I want to give you a second to answer this first question. And then I'd like to get uh, a few thoughts on where MEV is developing and where you guys are looking for it on chain. I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, it says, uh you would want to be the only sandwich that might happen on that trade? So I think there's two parts to it. Oh, maybe Sorry. it's not showing them all. The second part I think can be answered just because it occurs on chain at the moment where people's sandwich, people's sandwich attacks get sandwiched. You can become, you can uh, try and do a sandwich then you can come to meet in someone else's sandwich. And we've seen that happen a couple of times before. It just seems bad for everyone. I mean, now the the sound spot is also getting exploited as well as the user. Yeah, I, I guess what I was trying to say with that is just I, I we want our traders to get prices that they're happy with, um, and not like we don't want all marginal value created in the trade to go to some third party just because they like had a technological advantage. We want people to like capture the you know the marginal value that they th believe that they're creating with a particular trade for themselves. So, so as a DAP developer, how do you think about this going forward? Because, I mean, there's traders out there like Nathan, and then there's also uh, people like Robert who are trying to build uh, more neutral systems that allow people to interact with DAPs on chain in a fair way. But it seems like it's always like a you're on a treadmill, so to speak. Like you're always running and trying to figure this out. Yeah, I, the the ground is constantly shifting underneath our feet, and we're just trying to like pr build the best things we can in any particular context. Um, I'm really uh, intrigued by the idea of a proliferation of private mempools. Um, I, it kind of freaks me out, honestly. Um, like it's such a dramatic departure from the norm that we've seen it, like work for the past decade. Um, like Flashbots Protect is something that we've talked a lot about internally, a lot. Um, and people are really excited about it. Uh, some people are really freaked out about it, but like th there's no, I haven't, I've yet to see a like very strong critique of private mempools, which really surprises me. Um, and I would, I would really, if anybody knows of something like that, uh, I would love to to read it because it's it seems like such a major structural difference that there surely there is a good critique of it, but I I can't intuitively think of a, a major problem. Robert, if you have any thoughts on that, I, I'm all ears. Ooh, a major problem. Asking me to critique the product I launched. <laughs> <laughs> Could you define a, a, a mempool really quick also for our audience before you answer that? Uh, well, so when, when you create a transaction um, on a blockchain, it's not instantly executed. You know, it's not just like etched in stone and you're done, right? So there are a bunch of intermediate steps before your, your transaction is included on chain or not at all, right? Uh, and the mempool, the public mempool, is um, kind of the, the path that your transaction takes to make its way to miners and then propagates across the network to other miners as well. So if you run a full node, you have part of the mempool within your node. You can go and, uh, and, and part of the, the node's job is it's um, listening for new transactions from people, it's propagating transactions to other nodes on the network. It's like constantly passing things in and out. Uh, and this is, you know, integral to having a censorship resistant and a permissionless system. But it also gives people who are running full nodes the ability to peer into that and to catch transactions while they're on their way to being included in the network and manipulate them in ways that are, are negative for users. So part of the premise of uh, Flashbots Protect 
is to provide a direct to minor connection for users so that the transactions don't hit the public mempool where there are um, you know, hungry sandwich bots waiting to get in front of them, give them worse prices overall. Uh, and and I, I will, uh, I, I'll, I'll rise to the challenge, Jordan. So uh, at Flashbots, we like to point out the, the, the places in which our projects fall short so people can hold us accountable. Uh, and, I, and I hope those of you on the panel do and in the community abroad. So I think private mempools could be something that is, um, that is uh, very centralizing for the network overall. Uh, and I think it also turns the, um, uh, turns the network into something more opaque. For better or for worse, the public mempool is that it is public. And so everyone can sort of see transactions passing through. They have the same information set. Um, it has a level of transparency to it somewhat. There are kind of nuances over there. Uh, but you don't know what's going on with your transaction when it goes to Flashbots Protect, right? You assume that we are a good actor. Um, you assume that we're passing your transaction on without doing anything. And this is a repeated game where you see the game update, right? So you get you pass a transaction to us, you see the state of the chain, you see if you're a front run or not. You can choose to not use this if, if you don't want. But there are trust assumptions baked into that, and it is a more centralized vector that has you know less transparency over the outcomes. Um, so I, I think to be clear for the, for the uh, the listeners, I, I am not shitting on Flashbots Protect. I think it's a really cool thing. We are going to uh, we are planning on integrating it into Uniswap. Uh, oh, some alpha. It, yeah. Um, <laughs> We are actively working on uh, utilizing this service, uh, so it's uh, we're big fans of Flashbots. Maybe I could give a little bit of um, color to some like theoretical problems with having completely private mempools. I mean, as Robert touched on, and I think this is very important. Anyone running a full node or mining doesn't actually have access to the entire mempool. They only have access to a small part of the mempool. The mempool is being shared around everywhere, but each person only can see a small piece of it. And the mempool is like communicating information that traders are using to capture MEV. But that's not the only kind of information it's communicating. It's also communicating information about load on the network and it's communicating information about appropriate prices to set for transactions. And if you start to close off all of the mempools, then that information is no longer being communicated around the network and you have to find other ways of communicating it. And also another point that Robert touched on as well is this issue of censorship. When the mempools are open and everything is being shared around the network, you have some assurances about whether you're being censored or not, or whether something is happening to your transaction. Maybe it's getting delayed and someone's doing some kind of private statistical extraction that you don't know about. If you have confidence that your transaction is going everywhere around the mempool to all these different nodes and you can see that, then you can have some proof that that's not happening. Um, that's not to say that I don't like the idea of private mempools, but this is like a maybe an argument that you could make. Yeah, for sure. One this thing is, that this, sorry, go ahead. One thing that just crossed my mind as you were saying that is that uh, a proliferation of private or at least like secondary mempool mechanisms or like gossip uh, mechanisms uh, would be um, essentially like allowing users more choice in the uh, of their like privacy uh, of the transactions. Like we see in like Bitcoin, things like uh, Clover um, and Dandelion um, as like mechanisms for providing users with like better safety um, and like defense against Eclipse attacks or whatever their node. Um, and maybe that's one point in favor of uh, a proliferation of transaction relay mechanisms. So Nathan, I, I, uh, we're getting close to the top of the hour here. And there's two things that I want to touch on before we wrap up. Um, the, the very last bit of our conversation is going to be a bit more fun. We're going to roast someone, uh, but I'll let, I don't want to steal Will's thunder. We're going to get into that a little bit later. I want to talk about trading, sort of trading and DeFi and, and MEV a little bit for just a couple of minutes. Uh, I want everyone's opinions, but Nathan, I want to sort of target it at you first, because, you know, when you look at your average crypto trader and their activities, you know, they're look primarily, I guess, more so or less so now than in prior years, but operating on centralized exchanges, looking at inner uh, pair trades or arbitraging perpetual futures funding rates or spot and future spreads, all these sorts of things. They're like normal, relatively simple styles of trades. And the types of intricate strategies and trades that we're describing in terms of extracting value from new blocks being created on, on this conversation introduces, you know, like just dozens of 500 IQ strategies that you could try and understand and implement to your day-to-day -day trading strategy. And like my question is, 
these are very esoteric and niche things. H how, if at all, do you plan or expect these to become much more mainstream for your average crypto trader, which again is a very niche demographic um, and, and tools being built out for, like Jordan mentioned several minutes ago, you know, we want the average trader to have the best experience and achieve the most value from their activities as possible. Um, how can these sort of strategies be understandable and comprehensible and penetratable by, you know, your average, your average DeFi trader? And what do you see that sort of evolution looking like, I guess? I think you can make a lot of parallels there between traditional finance. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in traditional finance. It's very hard to understand. Companies paying billions of dollars to straighten fiber optic cables, teams of people with PhDs in physics designing convoluted, you know, regression models to capture pricing opportunities. And they get from like this really granular level of like extreme complexity to like more simple stuff that's more akin to like, you know, yield farming almost like putting your money in, in various different funds. And there's all these different like financial assets in traditional finance with different levels of complexity depending on how educated you are and what your desire is to understand them and i really think that's just what it's going to be mirrored in DeFi. you're going to have the really granular level strategies that the people with the phds in physics are doing you're going to have the more simple to understand things that are more akin to just having a financial advisor and putting your money in a hedge fund or something so i think yeah to answer your question i think this is actually somewhere you can just draw a lot of parallels to what's already happened in traditional finance Really interesting. I don't know, Robert, Jordan, before we go on to the last bit, any any thoughts on like mainstreaming some of these these uh, tactics and strategies? I'd say uh, join the Flashbots Discord. It's it's too busy nowadays. I liked it when it was quiet in February. It's too there's long a lot now. Of stuff going on, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, they, there's still a lot of good alpha in there. There were there was a bunch of interesting conversations earlier today. Um, I I don't know that I have anything more to add other than uh, what, what Jordan and Nathan have, but. I want to just point out that um, I think as a, a community, uh, as, a, as a cryptocurrency community, we need to think about the kinds of games that we want our MEV extractors to be playing, right? So Flashbots is very deliberately set up to maximize the efficiency of MEV extraction, such that MEV extraction uses as little gas as possible, so everyone else has as much space as possible, and it lowers the cost of transacting. Thank you, Jordan. Lowers the cost of transacting on chain, right? You have other designs of MEV auction systems, other chains that work in different ways. They may try to randomize ordering within blocks, for example, or do first in, first out. And these set up different games that people play to be uh, to, to extract MEV, such as, um, so I, I think a lot of these games end up resolving down to latency wars, like your old HFT style, who's quickest? Can I get the closest to a validator, co-locate with them? Um, can I write in the lowest level latency or whatnot? So I think like a, a broad kind of question that the, the community needs to ask itself is, is what do we value? What do we want to optimize for? How do we design these systems? Um, Flashbots has made our choices. I hope you think about it and, and, uh, and join us or, or make your own choices too. That would be an awesome segue to talk about tokenizing block space and EDA network, but we're not going to go that way. Uh, I'd actually want to pull up a video really quick from a Senate hearing back in July, if Damien can throw that up here in a second. So we'll watch this clip really quickly. Chairman Brown talked about the intermediaries as not simply um, a neutral uh, sort of uh, technical aspect, but they have a position which they could exploit uh, in, in, the, in this system. And at this point, we have no way to confirm who these people are. Is that correct? So um, I'm interpreting your question to be asking about um, who the intermediaries are within the systems, right? Um, who the middlemen are between one person sending a crypto token to another person. And that is the miners, right? A transaction doesn't end up on the blockchain unless a miner puts it on there. Okay, so. Um, they have not yet been recognized. We still, as, as intermediaries, right? People still call these systems disintermediated. And um, the power that they exercise is in choosing the transactions, ordering them, and um, they can delay people's transactions. They can um, take money to do what are called things like sandwich attacks and front running and back running and all kinds of games. And there has not been very good research into um, the mining or validating community. They're, they are coming out of the shadows much more. Um, 
Many of them have migrated just recently from China, where they were highly concentrated, and China recently um, made it illegal for miners to Bitcoin miners to operate there. So many are coming to the U.S., many to my home state of Texas. And um, I think these players need more scrutiny. They are intermediaries in important multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar financial systems. They need more scrutiny. Awesome. So looking at that clip, that was from July. Uh, and we saw that MEV was brought up on Capitol Hill, which was surprising to me at the time. I don't know if it's surprising to you guys. But from our perspective, they got a lot of things wrong, uh, or at least some of the experts on the panel got a lot of things wrong. And I want to get your guys' take on the whole idea of miners as intermediaries and how you see MEV going forward uh, as we see like the regulatory gauntlet kind of coming down. I, I mean, if you just came out to the cryptocurrency industry uh, picture about a year or two ago, and now we are seeing it in the regulatory landscape. So Nathan, I want to throw this to you first, but I'm very curious to get all three of your guys' opinions. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big advocate of decentralization. So when I hear something like that, I almost see it as somewhat of an attack on the idea that a blockchain should be completely decentralized. That's the whole idea of what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to replace the traditional financial system, which is highly centralized, with something that doesn't have any kind of centralized control. And when you're talking about miners as being the intermediaries or in control of the network and then saying we should regulate them or whatever you're almost attacking the idea that a blockchain should be decentralized so i would say unequivocally unequivocally that i would be i'm against i don't agree with what she's saying i think um uh, inopportune time to drink there but uh i think that uh the it, it it's really interesting and flashbots um I think has values that align with Nathan as well. We want to keep permissionless, censorship-free uh, systems, but we do see the heightened attention that block producers are getting, uh, not just in proof-of-work systems with ETH miners, but all types of uh, cryptocurrencies, all types of block producers too. You know, ultimately, we think uh, at Flashbots that the remedy to this is to keep a neutral position for block producers by splitting the party that builds blocks from the party that proposes blocks to the network, right? So uh, a validator in ETH2, your job will just be to, to sign a block um, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to just accept the most profitable block template from the network overall uh, and even have privacy preserving guarantees to that such that you don't actually know the contents of the block that you're proposing and, and no one does except for uh, the party that has built that block. So we see this split between block builders and block proposers uh, as integral to the future of Ethereum and cryptocurrency more broadly, uh, and as a way to enshrine the neutrality of block producers, um, you know, given the heightened regulatory attention that they're getting and, you know, certainly don't agree with the analysis as well. Yeah, I'd say that the word intermediary there was doing way too much work. Uh, she was using it to refer to multiple different things. Uh, different times she used it. Um, so that was particularly frustrating for me because in, in one sense, if you're like, these are people are intermediaries and in that they are participating in a gossip network and then uh, producing blocks um, and somebody needs to gossip say the transaction that will eventually be included in a block to them. So in that sense, yes, it is an intermediary. Like that person stands in between multiple parties, but in the traditional financial sense of the word, they are not intermediaries. They are not custodial in any sense and you their behavior is highly predictable. Um, they can't like, explicitly steal your money. Um, so um, I, I generally am very, very disheartened when I listen to anything uh, that politicians say about uh, crypto because it's generally quite inane. And I was kind of shocked at the uh, coherence of what was said there, except for that particular um, disingenuous usage of the word intermediary. Um, and my general inclination or my, uh, as an individual is my hope is that the, I, the crypto ecosystem. Um, my belief is that we'll be able to create technical solutions to all of these like problems. Um, I think that the problem that was being uh, insinuated there uh, is not a real one. Um, the uh, actual problems that we've been discussing, the, the actual like dynamics for users, um, are real ones. Um, and I believe that people like Robert are um, coming up with some great solutions to those. And um, me and my peers at Uniswap, we are, uh, as protocol developers, um, working on uh, designing systems that are maximally robust and maximally predictable for our users. And I think that that is the, the route that we should go and not some sort of, uh, you know, regulated position, like 
right? It, it's it's almost nonsense to talk about regulating mining in the first place. Like it's just like it doesn't work. One thing, yeah. that, you know, what is uh, what is front running? What is a sandwich a priori? Right? I think it's extremely difficult. Like technically, I'm not even sure that makes sense. Right? Um, I I don't think that's feasible at all. I think even if if that were to come, um, like the law would just be unenforceable too. And yeah. Yeah, that's one thing I want to touch on that I feel is like almost the most important thing that I took from what Jordan said is that this is about developing decentralized technology. And once we get sufficiently good at that and the technology is sufficiently advanced enough, these conversations sort of become irrelevant because, as Robert said as well, it's just not an enforceable system anymore. It, it, I know we're out of time, but one last quick thing is, is we want to build systems that make sense under assumptions of rationality. So people acting in their economic interests and not honesty. Uh, yep. and I think we're trying to do a flashbots. That exactly. makes a ton of sense. And I want to give you all gold stars for handling that clip with sort of very measured, cool responses, because I fucking hate that shit. It makes me so annoyed, <laughs> uh, especially her overuse of the word intermediary. Um, I re sort of reject it out of hand. It's not at all what any sort of miners do, no matter what chain you're mining, no matter how complex your mining strategies are. Uh, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, so I appreciate all of your measured <laughs> insights and responses to that, uh, that bit of sort of faux analysis there. Um, and we are coming up on time. I just want to share really quickly on Twitter. We had someone say this is the best MEV one on one discussion they've ever seen. So I want to give all three of you huge props. I hope it hasn't been too sort of banal and elementary to you to have this discussion, but it's been super fun for me and insightful for people watching. Um, as we wrap up, I want to give you just a, a single question lightning round really quick, um, just to pick your brains to know a little bit more about what you're looking forward to in terms of the MEV development space over the next you know, six, 12 months. Um, if anything stands out, it doesn't necessarily have to be anything, but just to wrap up uh, with a little forward looking um, insights from you guys uh, as to what you're expecting uh, on the near horizon. Um, Robert, Nathan, Jordan, hand it, to, hand it to you first, Robert, and then you guys can just jump in if there's anything you're looking forward to. Uh, so Flashbots last week just released um, V0.4, which is mega bundles, which means we can do more at the relay level, Flashbots relay, uh, and miners need to do less at um, the their client level if they so wish. So I think that unlocks a ton of innovation, ton of really cool stuff that Flashbots can do. Uh, and looking a little bit ahead, I think um, we're going to start working on full block proposals very quickly, moving towards that block pr producer, uh, I'm sorry, block proposer and block builder split that I was just uh, mentioning, I think that's also going to unlock a ton of innovation uh, and be good for the network overall. So those are two things I'm looking forward to in the next six to 12 months. I guess one thing I'm looking forward to as a searcher, I'll speak as a searcher, is that I, I foresee a lot of the uh, minor extractable value right now becoming relatively unprofitable. Atomic arbitrage, atomic liquidations, almost anything that happens in a single transaction, a single block will likely become not particularly profitable. And we'll start to see MEV move into more statistical strategies that resemble what um, trading firms are doing right now in traditional finance. So things where a position might open in one block, close 10, box, 10 blocks later, things might happen across multiple blockchains at the same time. Um, I mean, the idea of having price efficiency across like 10 different blockchains at the same time, that's really cool. Provides good UX to every user of every blockchain at the same time. So, I mean, as a searcher, I'm really excited for what's to come. I mean, you know, even if Flashbots completely succeeds in their goal and like the um, negative externalities are almost like eliminated within a block, I still think as a searcher, there's a really bright future out there and a lot of exciting stuff on the horizon. I'd say the thing I'm most interested in is uh, Flashbots Protect and uh, seeing how that goes um, and seeing how the mempool uh, changes over the next few years um, because of Protect and things like it. Awesome. Well, I want to thank all three of you for jumping on the stream. I also want to thank our audience. Uh, it seems from the comment section and from the audience on Twitter, we're saying that this one did pretty well. and. Uh, that's because of you three. So thanks for taking all our questions in stride, whether they're technical or simple. I uh, want to ask everyone to like and subscribe if you can on our channel. This helps more miners out there become better educated on the topics that matter and share this with a friend if that's something that interests you too. But uh, Jordan, Nathan, Robert, thank you so much for jumping on the stream and we'll see you guys on Twitter soon. Also go follow these guys on Twitter. They, they each have some, uh, some, some good content. Thank thanks, you. Guys. Thank you all. Thanks guys. It was awesome. And...